Merry Christmas everyone, Madrybred here. Pokemon Red with only one Rhyahorn was fun as always. Let's follow that up with something a little bit more festive. Today's the day that we figure out would I be able to beat Pokemon Black with a team of only Ice types. Alright, so right off the bat, there's only three Ice types in this game that we can get our hands on before the final battle. Chubchu, Vanillite, and Cryogonal. Now this is a fun Christmas run, and I'm allowed to evolve these Pokemon for once, but that is not going to mean that this is going to be easy. Ice is a really weak type defensively, only resisting other ice moves and being weak to some very commonly good offensive types. Not only that, but you can't catch many ice types until later in the game, so we're only going to have one Pokemon until the fourth gym, and then two until after the sixth gym. This might be a hard one. I'm predicting a difficult early game, a quick middle game, starting around the ground gym, <laughs> then a brick wall once we hit the Elite Four. It usually is. Like always, I'm writing this script as I go through with the challenge, so all this part is being written before I've started. Everyone comment down below and guess if I can win or not. I'm confident that I can win, but I think we'll likely need to be a pretty high level to do it. Ice just has a lot of weaknesses. Let's explain the rules. In combat, I can only use Ice types. I'll need other Pokémon to use HMs, but I won't be allowed to use any of those Pokémon in battle. No glitches or exploits, no items in battle, only Pokéballs, held items, and items outside of combat are allowed. Also, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for more. Let's do this. So right off the bat, I use the Universal Pokémon Randomizer to replace Snivy with Cubchoo so that we can do the whole run with it. I name him Casper, no, not that one. Give it a while, you'll get the naming convention. Anyway, our nature is naughty, so more attack and less special defense. I guess this is gonna make the early game harder, but in the long run we could probably get some really crazy damage out of Icicle Crash. I'm gonna roll with it and see what happens. Early game travel. Our Cub Chew has the stats of a first form starter, so balance early on isn't really too bad. All we have are some weak ice moves early on, but we don't really get anything great until we hit level 37 and evolve. Same with Vanillite, once we get that, it evolves at level 35, and that's around when it learns its decent moves. And Cryagonal, actually. So I guess our whole team will only get the good moves in the 30s. I'm predicting reasonably smooth sailing until the normal gym. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a nightmare, as it usually finds a way to be. Anyway, the first Bianca fight is normally one that I don't even talk about because it's so easy. But because we have Powder Snow and it's bad against both of our rival starters, I have to use Bide instead. It did get us a one-shot. I think that's my first time using Bide in a run. Now, I thought I'd just lose to Charon right after, since he's got a Fire-type, but we ended up freezing him right away. Hey, can't Pokémon in this generation just thaw themselves with a Fire move? I guess maybe he just doesn't have one yet. We still don't get any normal moves for a little while, so we have to brute force things with Ice and Bide. Okay, so the first gym starts great with us freezing Lil Pup so that we never took any damage, but you know we're doomed because Pansir is a higher level than us, faster than us, and completely obliterates us with Incinerate, which is not even a strong move. Like, it's not even close. I have to get to at least level 17 so that I have a normal type move, because this is not happening with Powder Snow. So after a way longer grind than you would expect, we hit level 17 and learned Fury Swipes. Now, I still thought that I'd lose a bunch of times, but on literally the first try, we hit Fury Swipes that not only had five hits in it, but two of them were crits! I mean, I'm like 99% sure that we didn't need Fury Swipes to be that lucky to win the fight, but I'm pretty sure that's the best Fury Swipes I've ever hit in my entire life, so that's pretty cool. And on our way out of town is another Charon fight, but this time we win pretty easily thanks to Fury Swipes. And, of course, him using Tail Whip over and over instead of using a Fire move. We easily could have lost that fight if he picked better moves, but he didn't. Anyway, that gets us back on the road. I'm gonna be honest, I'm kinda worried. Grinding is incredibly slow when you have a massive level difference between you and the wild Pokémon in Pokémon Black. Sometimes you luck out and you can get an Audino and Shaking Grass, since they give you crazy amounts of experience, but the experience they give you doesn't actually offset the experience loss that the Gen 5 system imposes upon you in terms of a whole grinding session. I mean, I, I have the recorded files, I can see how long it takes to do a Pokémon Black grinding session, and how long it takes to do previous games grinding sessions. And in Gen 5 it is just much slower. 
Especially if you're grinding in an area where Audino isn't the only thing that shows up in Shaking Grass, and that's the case in most areas where you end up having to grind in Pokemon Black runs, unfortunately. I would say that Rare Candy is the answer, but there's no way that we have our effort values maxed out yet, so it wouldn't be a great idea. I've made maybe 200 Pokemon faint at this point. I need to beat plenty more before we hit max effort values. That said, it wouldn't shock me if we max out our effort values before I beat the normal gym. Unless I get lucky. We'll see. Wow, the end fight outside the normal gym went pretty well. Again, this is another case of them using effect moves when they should probably just dogpile us with attacks, but it went pretty normally. Now can we even beat Hurtier in the normal gym? Probably not. Well, he missed his first move, we did a decent bit of damage, and then he one-shot us with a critical takedown. Yeah, let's go grind. <laughs> okay, I don't like to show you too much grinding nowadays because it's really rarely interesting, but it's something for you to watch while I go over strategy. So we do learn some new moves like Brine, and that's pretty cool, but it's not really the kind of move that's gonna turn the whole fight around for us. We're not a special attacker, and we're not water type. What I really want is Slash. It's our first good physical move, but it's all the way at level 33. By that point, we might be able to just brute force the fight just because we're such a high level, but the actual process of getting to level 33 would be awful. In fact, I'm certain that we'd max out our effort values before then, and we may as well just use rare candies once that happens. That said, we probably aren't maxing out our effort values until I make another 300 or so Pokemon faint, so I'm gonna be grinding away in this grass for a while to make that happen. I'll still try the fight once in a while though. Who knows, maybe we'll like freeze them with powder snow or something. Considering it's a 1 in 10 chance and how many times I have to hit that move over the course of trying these gym fights, it's not that rare to get a freeze. Alright, you need to see this amazing comedy of errors at level 27. Right away, Hurtier hits Leer, then misses Takedown, but we left her with a sliver so she uses a super potion to heal back up. She ended up missing yet another Takedown though, so we never took a hit. The funny part is if she just landed any of those takedowns, she would have sent in Watchhog while still having more potions to use. Watchhog on the other hand hit Retaliate to bring us to only 4 health, we missed Fairy Swipes, and it finished us off. Of course it did. Okay, all the way at level 32 and we literally take no damage in the fight because we crit to take out Hurtier and Watchhog uses Leer instead of Retaliate, throwing the fight. Whatever, a win is a win. But just as an aside, like for the AI, I understand that sometimes they'll do an effect move instead of an attack when they don't think they can one-shot you anymore, or they're afraid it won't do enough damage, but why would the AI ever pass up the opportunity to use Retaliate when their ally just fainted? That's the whole point of the move. <laughs> I just, there's there's no reason why it wouldn't do that. Okay, with that done, we have the Bug Gym, three rival fights, and then the Electric Gym. I'm not really worried about the Bug Gym, because his strongest Pokemon is part Grass type, and I don't think that the rival fights after will be too hard. Maybe the N one will be, that tends to be rough. I do think we're gonna get stuck at the Electric Gym pretty badly though. Maybe if we evolve first, then it'll go okay, but I just don't see us winning that fight until we get Icicle Crash at level 37. Yeah, the Bug Gym was a squash. Get it? Because bugs? I think we literally got hit once, and it didn't do much, so easy, Jim. Bianca right after was easy as always. She landed one hit the whole fight, and it was a critical Psybeam. Uh, don't get me wrong, it hurt a lot, but 9 times out of 10, that wasn't gonna happen, so she probably wouldn't have done more than 20 damage to me. She got lucky, and even then, it still didn't do much. Right after is Charon, who is also really not that much of a threat, but between the Sandstorm and his Flame Charge, we did take a lot of damage. Not enough to faint, and I still doubt we could have lost without being critically hit, but it was closer than usual. Now this end fight took tons of tries. The first two Pokemon are one shot, so the real fight starts at Scraggy. This little monster completely ruined us on so many runs with a Brick Break, but at least this time he didn't crit, so the damage range was somewhat kind, so we could take him out. Sigalith was next, and right away he used a two turn move that couldn't finish us off, giving us enough hits to actually take him out. I know that looked easy, but trust me when I say that this fight can go a lot of different ways. The Electric Gym actually ended up being really easy because we hit level 37 just before getting to the Gym Leader, making us evolve. 
Thanks to that, we could just brute force them with Icicle Crash, even at a lower level than them. Oh, and of course Charon couldn't handle us now that we're evolved. His fire moves still do decent damage, but Icicle Crash with this high attack of a Pokemon is just too much for them to handle at this point in the game. We're almost level 40, they're not ready for that kind of damage output. Hey, it's finally time to get another Pokemon! Now that we have access to the cold storage, we can get ourselves Vanillite, our second Pokemon. I name it Malkior, or I will name it Malkior when I hit up the Pokemon nickname dude, since I kind of forgot to give it a nickname when I first caught it. Whoops. I think the guy for that is back in the bug town. I'll just nickname him later when we fly back there anyway. Any more guesses on those names? I mean, someone has to know by now. Now, I don't think it's going to be useful until it hits level 35, since that's when it evolves and learns Ice Beam, but at least we have it. I can slap an experience share on it, and I'm sure it'll catch up in levels before you know it. Now let's go sweep that ground gym. Naturally, it was nearly a sweep, no danger at all. I think Bianca might put up more of a fight on the way out of town, but we have that never melt ice from the cold storage, so we might just sweep all the way to Twist Mountain. Yeah, Bianca ended up being super easy. We only took one hit the entire fight, although it did a bit more damage than I was expecting. I get the feeling that as soon as we run into a properly strong fighting or fire type, then we're gonna have some serious issues. Anyway, it's back to traveling. I still think that the end fight is probably gonna be pretty easy, even though he has a bunch of steel types, just because I think we can brute force him. After that is the flying gym, and I'd imagine that would be a sweep, but after that is a Charon fight that tends to be a little bit harder. I could see a starter being a real problem there. It's fire and fighting, and it should be pretty strong by then. Maybe Vanillite will be evolved by then? It wouldn't do very well in the fight, but just having a second Pokemon in that fight would really help us. Yeah, N was basically a sweep. Even with his Steel types, we could just brute force him. I bet the Flying Gym is gonna be even easier. Okay, at the Flying Gym, it was obvious that we could win. But what was more amazing is that Vanillite became Vanillish before we entered the gym. So we ended up just taking out her entire team without getting hurt once, and we didn't even have to use Never Melt Ice to do it. It's nice to have some easy fights, because I think we're very close to hitting the hard part of this run. Sharon actually ended up being really easy, and I think part of that is just because it's winter, so the entire battle had a hailstorm going on. Naturally, that not only hurts them, but powers up our ice moves, making it even easier to just squash them. Finally, we're at Twist Mountain, and that means that we can get our last Pokémon, Cryagonal. I go ahead and name him Balthazar. Alright, I I'm gonna give you a minute to see if anyone's got this. Feel free to pause and write in the comments. No, not Chrono Trigger. Think of the source material here. Where did Chrono Trigger get the names from in the first place? Alright, I'll give it a little bit longer. I'll let you know before the Elite Four. The Ice Gym was actually closer than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, none of our Pokémon fainted, but Casper almost did. He got hit by Swagger, then hit himself in confusion, doing quite a bit of damage. I actually ended up having to use Rest before the end of the fight, just to keep him healthy. But I think that just goes to show how little of a threat they were, that I used Rest, and they couldn't do anything to stop us. It's not like I built up my defense or anything, we just let him hit us, and then we won anyway. With all of that done, we're at the part where it simply must get more difficult. Maybe the next Bianca fight will be okay, and I'm sure the Dragon Gym will be easy, but that's the end of the smooth sailing. We have the final Charon fight, followed by an Elite Four that is always pretty difficult. The Elite Four in this game are gonna have quite a few moves that are good against us, and I don't expect to have many moves that are good against them. So I'm expecting I'll need to brute force most of it. I'll be quite surprised if I don't need to do a full party grinding session before we get close to beating them. Let's just worry about getting there first, though. Oh, and I, I have sponsorship written down in the script here, but I have nothing lined up for this. So, uh... Uh, Merry Christmas, everybody! Super chats and super thanks! Go to the Patreon if you want to send all of your money to the North Pole! <laughs> I don't know, how are you supposed to advertise super chats and a Patreon in, in a Christmas episode? What's the protocol on that? How do you do that without making it seem super weird? Oh, you can't? Okay, I guess we'll just get back to the video then. <laughs> Alright, last Bianca fight. Right away we made Stoutland flinch off Icicle Crash so it never hit us. Amazing start. Out to Balthazar for Simiseer so that I could set up Light Screen and it did a great job, as Flame Burst hardly hurt us after that. 
We traded shots for a little while and we ended up winning. I kind of assumed Balthasar would faint. Casper was able to do all right damage to Samurott on the first hit, and we took so much damage from Revenge that I thought we'd faint on the follow-up, but our second attack made him faint instead. After that is Masharna, who lucked out and dodged our first icicle crash. We were able to take her down even after she used a full restore, but the miss gave her a chance to take us to red health. This fight actually took a few tries, but it wasn't too bad. Oh, and the dragon gym was super easy. I thought we were going to beat the whole thing with Cragonal at first, but he ended up going down. Considering that's the Pokemon on the team with the lowest effort values, that's pretty impressive. I kind of like that our team is already all around the same level. It's pretty easy to get them reasonably equal with just an experience share when you have a team of three. Okay, here's what I was afraid of. So, I tried the Charon fight a few times, but every time Embor just completely destroys us with Flamethrower. I tried using Reflect to stop his Heat Crash, but he just used Flamethrower instead, so he's got an answer for me shutting down either attack or special attack. I figured the Brick Wall would either be this fight or the Chandelure in the Elite Four. Let's grind up a bit and try again. Oh, and since it's winter, we can reach the TM for Substitute in Twist Mountain. I should go grab that. It might save us considering how frail we are. I don't know if I'll actually need it too much since I have multiple Pokemon to work with, but uh, who knows, there's no harm in getting it. We're back! Many tries and a few levels later. On this run, we take out Unpheasant without getting hit thanks to it going for Razor Wind, and next to Zambor. I set up Reflect right away to survive takedown, then confuse him, and this time he hit himself. I also set up a light screen just in time since he used Flamethrower, and we survived because of it. After that, I just kept hitting Ice Beam till we eventually went down, but we did a decent amount of damage at least. Reflect wore off as we sent in Casper, but thankfully, Lightscreen was still active and we could just hardly survive Flamethrower to knock him out. Now, I was gonna use Rest as Simisage came out, but he ended up being faster than us and he made us faint. That's not good. Melkior was able to one-shot him, but only after losing half of his health. Last was Lipard, and I was really worried about Night Slash critting and making us lose, but it didn't crit, so we just hardly held on to get the knockout. It was close, and this took a bunch of tries, but we did get the win. Alright, all that's left is the path to the Elite Four. I'm really not feeling confident, though. Typically in challenge runs, we have to grind quite a bit once we hit the Elite Four, but in Gen 5 runs, it's especially true. Despite having four Pokémon per trainer instead of five, I find the Gen 5 Elite Four to be the hardest that I typically do Pokémon challenges in. They've got some pretty well put together teams that can handle basically anything I could throw at them, at least considering I have an all ice type team. Ice really is not a good type against the Elite Four, like at all. I'm pretty sure like half the Pokemon that we're gonna be fighting between now and the end of the game have at least one move that's super effective against ice types. So I'm expecting that we're gonna need to be way stronger before we make any real progress. Now that we're at the Elite Four, let's take a look at our team. Well, the first thing I notice is that our entire team has bad defense, so that's probably explaining why I've been feeling so frail during travel recently. I like how high Casper's attack is, and I like Melchior's mirror coat and hail since it might let us do something creative, but Balthazar is kind of dead weight at this point, aside from being fast and having cool effect moves. 132 health and 47 defense? He'd get one shot by just about any fighting move. Maybe I could get away with just using it for Reflect Light Screen and Confusion, though. That seems like what it's best at. Between the Fighting Elite Four member, Chandelure on the Ghost team, and Scrafty on the Dark team, I think there's exactly a 0% chance that we make it past the Elite Four with a team under the level of, I don't know, 60 or 70? Make your final guesses on if we can win this or not. Let's do this. Oh, yeah, and uh, is the Three Wise Men. Yeah, one of them is named Casper. Weird, right? I only even remembered Malkior and Balthazar. That's probably because of Chrono Trigger. <laughs> First is Ghost Trainer Chantel. Obviously, we lose to Chandelure, but I wanted to see how long we lasted against it. I tried Light Screen, Confuse Ray, Hail, and just rained down shots when I could. Now, maybe if I had better luck with him using Fire Blast while we were using Mirror Coat during the Light Screen, then maybe we could have taken him out but who knows if I could have even gotten her to do that or if we'd survive. I can do the Elite Four in any order in this game, let's try fighting her again later. Second is Dark Trainer Grimsley. I thought we were instantly doomed, but Scrafty used Sand Attack on the first turn, well we made it hail, then we crit Ice Beam for a one-shot. That was super lucky. 
totally didn't need the crit, too. Crocodile was next and did a lot of damage to Casper, but we one-shot it with Icicle Crash. That's when we completely fell apart, as he sent out Basharp. We have no great answer for Steel types, and he's pretty easily able to demolish our entire team. I guess in fairness, he is about the same level as us, and he has a huge advantage in terms of type and moves. I'll try the other trainers first. Look, we're gonna instantly lose the fighting one, right? Third is fighting trainer Marshall, so first is Throw, who crit us for a bit of damage, but we got our hail up and we crit him right back to take him out. Decent start. Sock could have taken us out right away, but he missed Stone Edge, so we landed a massive Ice Beam. He hit his next one and almost made us faint, but we still took him out. I can't believe how well this is going. Out to Casper to deal with Conkeldur, and he didn't hit us for once. This is amazing. And last is Mineshow, who just one shot swept our whole team. Uh, that's what I get for getting my hopes up. Fourth is Psychic Trainer Caitlyn. Yeah, Reuniclus just swept the only good members of the team with Focus Blast. It wasn't even with critical hits, they just one-shot us. We only made it faint because Balthazor is fast enough to hit the final move, but it's not like it could take out the whole team on its own. So yet again, we walk into the Gen 5 Elite 4 and instantly lose to all four members, like usual. I'm gonna go do a massive grind and then come back. It's quite obvious we're not ready yet. We're back, after many levels. Now, we have Hail, so I set it up right away and start hitting Blizzard. We lucked out again and didn't get burned, but I don't think it would have mattered much if we did. I sent in Balthazar to set up a light screen against Chandelure as we got crit by Payback. We confused her, and she still used Fire Blast, but she missed, so we got to start landing more hits. Hail wore off pretty fast at this point, but Chandelure just keeps hitting itself. We almost got the knockout when she snapped out of it and finished us off. I had to send in Casper next, but of course she used a full restore to heal. I thought we were doomed when we dropped her to a sliver, and she used Fire Blast, but she missed again. That would have probably one-shot us if it hit. It took a lot of one-shots, but we took her down. Golurk dodged Icicle Crash, hit a strong Brick Break, then got one-shot by us on the follow-up. Last is Jellicent, and I sent in Malkior because I've learned my lesson that this thing is hard to take down with ice moves. I had Malkior start hail so that we could spam Blizzard to overpower it, and the first one crit! It still didn't do much despite being a critical Blizzard during hail with never melt ice and the same type attack bonus on a high special attack Pokemon! So I guess that just goes to show how tanky it is. <laughs> We took it out, but this fight was far from easy and required a lot of luck with Fire Blast missing twice. Next is Grimsley, and right away we take out Scrafty as he uses Sand Attack and we just don't miss. Second is Crocodile, who goes down easily but hits like a freight train. So I have Malkior just outspeed it and put it down, knowing that it wouldn't be affected by Intimidate. Next is the terrifying Basharp, and I start to hail right away. Metal Claw is super effective against us, but we do so much damage with our Hail and Blizzard combo that we could just brute force him before he could take us down. Last is Lipard, who never really was a problem. We could probably beat him with anyone on our team. That was pretty easy, all things considered. After that is Marshall, so I just went straight for Hail and Blizzard. Throw really wasn't doing much damage to Melchior, so I could just take my time landing hits and driving down his healing items. We did run out of Blizzard power points though, so that's not good. Sock nearly one-shot Melchior, but he's faster and was able to take us down in two hits of Stone Edge, but not before using more healing items and nearly fainting to hail damage. Balthazor was faster though, and he just went in and finished it. Casper had a really easy time with Conkeldur, thanks to flinching him, so he never hit us. And last was Mine Xiao, who swept us last time. This time we put up Reflect, survived a jump kick with red health, confused him, got taken out, then Mine Xiao lost a turn to confusion, and that's what let Casper land the one shot. Not bad! Last for the Elite Four is Caitlyn, so right away, I went for the Light Screen and Confuse Ray combo. It totally shuts down Reuniclus, who we ended up critting to take down even faster than I expected. For Gothitel, I just sent in Casper to brute force it, although we missed the first swing and took a bit of extra damage as a result. But hey, we got her to use two full restores, so that's good. Masharna is next, so I had Malkior use Hail and Ice Beam. We took a lot of damage, but we took it out with half of our health left. And last was Sigilith, who of course was weak to ice and just went down in one hit. We're making progress again! With the Elite Four down, all that's left is the two final fights with N and Getsis. 
I'm gonna be honest, as much as I like all the little tricks that I've been pulling with Reflect and Hail and all of that, I don't think we're ready to beat N or Getsus. Maybe we could beat N, but I doubt we can beat Getsus without leveling more. Let's find out. Okay, this took a million tries. Zekrom is always easy, we can just one-shot it since we're Ice-type, but the rest of the fight is much harder. Second is Zoroark, who's pretending to be Kling Klang like usual, but the strategy was just to use Ice Beam with Balthazar. We got really lucky on this try and froze him, so he had to use a full restore. Thanks to that, we not only wasted one of his healing items, but take him out without being hit. Out to Malkior for Karakosta, and this thing messed us up on so many tries. Right away, I made it hail, nearly fainted to Stone Edge, then hit Blizzard for pretty good damage before fainting. Balthazar is thankfully very fast and could finish it off quickly. Archaeops was a one-shot, since it was still hailing, but next is Vanillix, so they're going to be powered up by our weather effect. Casper did solid damage with Slash, but Vanillix is faster and just two-shot us. So we had to send in Balthazar to confuse it. I was hoping we could whittle it down a little bit, but our only attacking move is Ice Beam, and we're getting hit pretty hard. We managed to take it down, but that left us with his last Pokemon, the real Kling Klang. I confused him and got him to hit himself a few times. We got insanely close to taking him out when he finally hits the last Flash Cannon to knock us out instead. Okay, well, at least we have tons of effort values, so I can just use Rare Candy to level up a bit. It took a lot of luck to get an attempt that close. Maybe a few more levels will help? Okay, so I tried the fight three more times with each team member at level 65, and the entire fight went literally the exact same, except for Casper doing slightly more damage with non-critical slashes, letting us two-shot Vanillux. Because of that, we're able to make it to the final Kling Klang with two Pokemon left, and although it's still incredibly close, we finally get the win. That leaves us with the final boss, Getsis. Right away, it's Kofagrigus, so I made it hail and overpowered it with Blizzard. We lucked out and it missed Toxic, so we didn't even get poisoned. Nice. Second is Hydreigon, and we instantly nearly got taken out by Focus Blast, but we one-shot him in return. I should've used Balthazar for that, he'd probably be faster and get the one-shot. The Sharp is next, so I was worried, but Blizzard still hit pretty hard. We did faint though, so no more Malkior. Casper was next and the hail stopped fast, so we couldn't get a two-shot. Thanks to that, we lost half of our health before we took him down. Out to Balthazar for Electros, and right away I set up Light Screen, but he just used Acrobatics, so we just got another hit in, then fainted. All we have left is half health Casper, so I had to come in and finish Electros off. It's not looking good. Buffalant is next, and he brings us to only 18 health with Head Charge as we finish him off. Last was Seismitoad, so I used Rest to heal right away as he missed with Muddy Water. While we were asleep, he made it rain, then used Muddy Water again, so I knew that I had a short time limit. That's when we woke up and landed a crit to one-shot him, beating Getsus on the first try even after I somehow made obvious mistakes early in the fight. Guys, it's a Christmas miracle. You know, that was really fun. Normally, team runs in Pokemon Black are a bit daunting because the leveling mechanics force us to spend a lot longer grinding, but this run was actually really well paced out. I'm super happy I decided to go with ice types in general, and not just first form ice types, or it would have been a needlessly frustrating run. I really hope you guys like that run. There's no challenge next week since I'm taking a few days off for Christmas. These challenges will be back in two weeks though. As always, I'm looking forward to your suggestions in the comments, in the challenge request section of my Discord channel, and on Twitter. Subscribe, ring the bell, stay tuned. Outro time, uh, so it's like a week and a half, I believe, before Christmas right now when I'm recording this voiceover. Um, well, what day is it today? It is the 15th. Okay, so Christmas is in 10 days, week and a half, I guess I was right. Uh, but the time that this comes out, it's going to be two days before Christmas. I don't know if you're going to be watching this on Christmas or whatever, but I like to have the video come out on Saturday like usual, you know, when you expect it. Otherwise, I would delay it for Christmas, but why delay it? You get your Christmas present early if you consider this, this video to be a Christmas present. I'm sorry, it's not as elaborate as my previous Christmas challenge when I did Black 2 for the first time. That was really, really fun, but I also had enough time to do it that year, and then last year I didn't get to do a Christmas special because I was bedridden with the health stuff with my neck at the time, so I didn't even get to do one last year. So this year, I'm just happy that I got to do something at least a little bit thematic. At least it was snowing in the game and we used ice types and stuff, even if it's not quite as fancy. I hope that you have a 
a really awesome uh, Christmas this year or any other holiday that you may or may not celebrate. I hope that you have an awesome year in general. I was about to sit here and be like, oh, I should list what I'm thankful of. Uh, but then then I remember that's Thanksgiving. It's, it's literally in the name. <laughs> it's not. I mean, you, you can be thankful on Christmas, obviously. I, I guess that is part of the holiday. I just feel like the whole saying what you're thankful for is kind of more of a Thanksgiving thing. But then again, I didn't do any kind of Thanksgiving thing. So uh, what am I grateful for right now most in this moment? Well, one is that somehow I can make these unbelievably repetitive videos <laughs> that I have a blast making, and somehow people have a blast watching four years later. I get to feed my family and pay my rent by making these videos. That's that's kind of nuts to me because yeah, I, I know how much work goes into it. I do all of the work. I know it's a full time job and everything. I'm, I'm here doing it, but it's it's still astonishing to me. Um, not just that I could make a living doing Pokemon challenges, but that four years later, there's still enough people watching that I still make a living. Like, you gotta understand the life cycle of a YouTuber. Usually, you, you hit your big peak, and then within about two years, you're never gonna hit that peak ever again. <laughs> That's how it is for most people, and yeah, I may never hit that peak ever again. I'm totally fine with that, by the way, uh, because I never really wanted to be that, that big. Uh, I, I already passed my all-time subscriber goal. I ever only ever wanted to hit 300,000. I passed that like uh, three years ago or something. So I don't really care that I'm not growing that much anymore. All I care about is that enough of you guys are still watching that uh, that I can be thankful that my whole family is taken care of through my, my work and, and you guys watching and all of that. And I'm very thankful that after... Um, I've done over 6,000 videos now on my channel that after all of the hours that I've put into this, I have been able to carve out a real career for myself and a, a real proper livelihood for for me and the people that I care about. Um, I'm super, super proud of that. And obviously that means I'm also really thankful because I understand that uh, that doesn't happen without an audience and an audience who cares and an audience who uh, genuinely wants to support me, um, one who follow me and they, they listen to the little outro bits and they, they follow me on Twitter or they watch some other thing I do and they realize that, uh, yeah, there's a human behind this show. And although the Pokemon challenges are not so ad libby, they're a lot more scripted and everything, and thus I'm going to be presented a little bit more polished there, I guess, that uh, people still see through and they still see the person behind it and they know that I'm being genuine with them and everything. And um, that's something that's that's a kind of um, uh, consideration that I didn't think I was ever going to get from anyone beyond the like 200, 300 people who would watch all my Let's Play videos before I blew up. I knew the old school people would all know who I am kind of as a person and uh, be very uh, friendly towards me based on that. I, I guess that's how I put it. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I Just the fact that I blew up and you see so little of my personality in these Pokemon challenge videos just because it's a little short thing, you know? It's a little short scripted 20-30 minute video in comparison to all these other videos I do and streams I do that are like hours long and you see me unscripted in all of this. And yet so much of it shines through that people have decided whether they like me or not and it, it turns out a lot of people do and they tell me that on a regular basis. Um, it's, it's genuinely very flattering and it's it's very heartwarming um, because I know that when they give me those compliments, it's not just like a weird parasocial thing of like, uh, I am whoever I present myself as. I'm, I'm not good at presenting myself as anything that I'm not. I, I just tell you like my actual opinions on stuff and I, I'm pretty straightforward with you. So I don't know, just the fact that I, I try to present myself as honestly as I can and that people genuinely like that person, uh, that's something that gets me kind of like a little bit emotional because uh, I, I can take that praise personally because they're they're praising me as a human instead of just uh, the, the character they see on screen, you know? So, yeah, that's what I'm thankful for. Uh, I'm thankful that I'm able to support my family and make a living doing this, even though I will past my peak as a YouTuber. Um, I'm 
so happy that I still get to try new things on YouTube and make goofy new videos, and they get a whole bunch of comments on them, you know? Even if I do some completely un-Pokemon related thing, it'll still get like 3,000 views and like over 50 comments, and dude, that's all I ever wanted coming up in YouTube as a Let's Player, is to be able to put up videos and have enough comments on them that I could joke around back and forth with people who enjoyed the Let's Plays. So the fact that uh, every single day now, no, no matter what video I upload, there are going to be enough comments that I can have a fun time reading them and seeing what people enjoyed in the videos and joking back and forth with people, that is literally my dream come true. And um, the fact that I haven't lost that over four years of making the exact same format of video with just minor alterations and, of course, me improving at it in general, um, that's crazy. I never would have predicted that it would still be going this long and that people would still want to watch it because I'm still having fun making it. <laughs> I'd be making it when no one was watching. And you know that because my first three entire Pokemon challenges were all uploaded uh, before any of them blew up. I did all of that work knowing that at the time I was gonna make about $20 <laughs> from each video that took me weeks to make at the time, uh, and I still did them. Sometimes I wonder if uh, the fact that I had all three of those up before people found me is what told people that like, I'm actually doing it because I like it. Maybe that's what did it. Who knows? That or it's just my voice. They can usually tell from my voice that I'm having a fun time. Every once in a while, people will be like, oh, he sounds so sad and tired now. I, I always get so sad when I read those ones, because in reality, if you thought I sounded sad and tired and like my heart wasn't in it in one of these Pokemon challenges, nine times out of ten, you know what that means? It means that I had a sore throat that day, and that's why I sound low energy, and it's because I was having fun recording and shouting and stuff, and so my voice gave out on me. Uh, <laughs> so no, if I sounded a little bit down because I have like a gruff voice in a video and I sound lower energy, it's because I expended my voice and my energy loving my job earlier in the week. Don't worry about it. I still absolutely love this. I wouldn't do anything else in the world. Like, who would give up this gig? This is fun. Yeah, um, that's what I'm thankful for. Happy not Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I, I guess I should go get, uh, get on editing this stuff. Thank you, everybody, so much for watching, and until next time, Merry Christmas.